Yeah. Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 30 of the Protection Dog Podcast, where we offer an alternative to conventional dog training and philosophy. I'm your host, Joel Riles, and today we are going to explore the question of why it is so difficult for people to think outside their own experience. But before we get into that, we're going to uh, first talk about our sponsors. Today's sponsor is Fortress Canine. Fortress Canine is bringing you peace of mind through protection dogs. They have protection dogs that are safe for you, your children, your other pets to include small dogs and cats and other um, animals that would could potentially be uh, at risk if you have a dog that was aggressive toward them. Fortress K9 protection dogs are non-aggressive. They're not aggressive toward other people, uh, pets, all that kind of stuff. They are prepared to defend you and trained to defend you when you need it, but they are safe uh, at all other times. That's what they specialize in. So they offer personal protection dogs, family protection dogs, and executive protection dogs. You can contact them on their website, FortressK9.com. That's F-O-R-T-R-E-S-S the letter K, the number nine, dot com. You can also email them at joel, J-O-E-L, at fortressk dot com. And you can find them on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube by searching Fortress K9. Don't forget also about our puppy sales. Uh, we have a litter getting ready to drop. By the time you guys hear this, they'll probably already all be sold and gone. But there are always litters coming up. So, uh, if you're interested in getting a German Shepherd, Dutch Shepherd, or Belgian Malinois uh, that is a solid working dog but also has an off switch, that's kind of how I like to describe our lines, then uh, contact us and we will get you uh, on the reservation list and make sure you get squared away. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get into the topic for today. So the question I wanted to ask for today is, uh, why is it so hard for people to think outside of their own experience? So I've been listening to uh, multiple different um, podcasts and speakers lately, and something kind of became uh, obvious to me as I was doing that. So one of the things that I experience a lot are people that will get on, and um, whether they're trolls or whether they're just kind of ignorant and rude <laughs> in the way that they introduce their questions, but they'll ask things like, okay, so, um, actually usually it's, it's formed in the, in the form of a statement, something like, well, you're doing that wrong, or, you know, that's not how a dog should bite, or, you know, um, you shouldn't introduce knives to, to dog biting, things like that, right? They'll say things like the stuff that we do and they'll just look at it and they'll say, you shouldn't do that, or that's not how you should do it, right? And so usually if they say something like, oh, well, you know, that dog's bite is too weak and, and the way that you're doing your uh, knife fighting isn't the way you should be doing it. I usually just respond back and say something like, well, how do you guys do it? Like, I'd love to hear, if you have a better way of doing it, I'd love to hear how you guys do it. And the responses are almost always something like, well, not like that, which basically means they don't do it at all and they don't know how to do it. And so all they can do is just go, well, that's not how my trainer said I should do it or that's not how the guy I learned from said I should do it, or that's not how our sport says you should do it, right? And they have an inability to think beyond whatever tiny little experience they have. And all of our experiences are tiny, right? When I first started really challenging my own uh, political and philosophical thoughts, I would seek out people who had been to multiple different countries, who had gone to multiple different places, who had studied multiple different religions. Because if all you ever do is just study under people who agree with the way that you think, then 
you don't know if you're right or wrong, right? So for instance, if you're a Christian, which I am, you should not be afraid to have a discussion with a Muslim or an atheist or a whoever it is, because first of all, just because you believe something to be right doesn't mean that it is, right? And secondly, if it is right, then it should stand up to whatever uh, challenges come its way. That's how you test something to see if it's right or not. So if you want to know if an idea is right, find people who disagree with you and see if your idea holds up, okay? So ultimately, as I was watching all these things and kind of pondering this question because it's it really is baffling to me how many people, like I can understand that some people would fall into this category, but it's amazing to me that for the most part, unless they've been specifically introduced to challenging their own ideas, most people are completely unable to think outside of their own experience. And what I mean by outside their own experience is this. So, um, you know, let's say that a guy is interested in self-defense, right? So he buys a firearm, he learns how to shoot it at the range, uh, he studies online, um, he reads books about it, he practices some of the techniques, so he's fairly, he's proficient at handling his weapon, right? Reloading and, and clearing malfunctions and firing it at a target, and hitting a target. And he's read about how to use it in a fight, but he's never actually been in a fight. Now, I understand in terms of gunfights, we're kind of limited in our ability to just go out and get in one, right? You can't just kind of go out and get in a gunfight. For the most part, there, there are ways to do it where people don't die. But unless you've been in combat, because even that the training is, it's good. It's, you know, if you go and do force on force training with like airsoft or simunitions uh, or even paintballs, if you're doing it in, in some way that somewhat resembles reality, it's, that, that is good. It, it helps overcome a lot of the issues, but it's still not the same as actual combat or actual life and death threat situations, right? So sometimes I'll get responses uh, to a post. Uh, I remember I posted one where we were introducing a dog to, um, to getting past a, a barrier, right? So the person um, had basically the simulation is the person grabbed a hold of a chair or something that they could get a hold of and tried to use it to keep the dog off of them, right? To keep the dog from biting them. And I got a response from a guy that said, oh, you only have 2.8 seconds for this and then 4.6 seconds for that. And if you haven't like totally ended the guy in 12 seconds, you're dead. And I was like, huh, sounds like uh, you've read a lot about being in fights, but you've never actually been in one. Because nobody who's been in a fight says, oh, you got this many, you know, 2.4 seconds for X and 4.6 seconds for Y because that's not how fights actually go. That's a statistic, right? And statistics can be helpful and useful when we're trying to, to decide different things, but statistics have no basis in reality when it comes to boots on the ground. Statistics are a way to make broad-based decisions, but they have no specific application to a specific situation in almost every situation, right? Now, there might be exceptions to that, but when you're in the middle of a fight, you don't have X point X seconds, you have until he draws a weapon. But if he's just holding the chair or whatever it is he's holding and trying to keep the dog off of him, the distraction of the dog has just blown all of your statistics out of the water, right? Because if he at any point goes to reach for a weapon, now he's only got one hand on the barricade and the dog can easily knock it out of his hands or whatever the situation may be at that moment. That's an example, right? But he has no actual experience in fighting and so therefore he thinks that everything is based on these, you know, point seconds of how long you have before X, Y, and Z actually happens, right? And that's just not how fights actually go. Sometimes they go really, really fast. Sometimes they go really, really slow. As a general rule, there's usually, unless somebody's trying to sneak attack you, right? Like there's a guy out trying to, to capture a woman for to put her into the sex trade, which is a real threat. 
right? Now, in that situation, you're going to be basically ambushed. But in a you know a threat situation where somebody's going to walk up to you and try and engage you in order to to rob you, right? That you're gonna there's going to be some level of posturing and engagement before you want, you know as the person whether or not this is a true threat or not, right? So you're going to start off like, hmm, I see this person, I'm not really sure, I want them to keep their distance, blah, blah, blah. And if they're organized, there might be more than one person, right? <clears throat> or it could just be some dude who's, um, you know, coming off his meth high and needs some money to go get some more. And you just don't know, and every fight is different. So the, the term for this, which I didn't uh, really become familiar with this term until fairly recently, is called normalcy bias normalcy bias. So if you've listened to me for any length of time, you know that um, we talk a lot about training your subconscious mind and all of this kind of stuff. And that is all good and really important. But normalcy bias is your subconscious mind's way of dealing, number one, with complexity, but number two, with fear. Okay? And so a lot of people are afraid. And, and I'm not knocking being afraid. I'm sure I'm afraid of things. Everybody's afraid of something. But we have to become comfortable with fear. And that's something that's really difficult to do and it's really uncomfortable. So I'm not saying that like it's an easy thing and we're not gonna get a ton into that today. But your subconscious mind goes, yeah, yeah, I see these things that look really out of place, but I'm sure it'll be fine because every other time we went through here, it was fine. Right, that's kind of how your, sub, your, your normalcy bias works. Your, your subconscious is going, we can't process too much complexity right now, so we're just going to assume it's gonna be like it always was, right? So an example of normalcy bias that's not destructive is when you hit your brakes in your car, your car slows down and stops, right? You hit the gas in your car, your car goes. So you can drive a car, if you've been driving for say 10, 15 years, you can drive a car and do something else at the same time and unless there's some real crazy thing that happens in front of you, you're gonna be fine because your brain's normalcy bias, your subconscious understands what to do and as long as it doesn't have to process a bunch of new information, as long as things stay fairly consistent in how they operate, then your subconscious mind using normalcy bias will just drive you there, right? Where normalcy bias becomes dangerous and difficult is when your subconscious mind doesn't have a slot to put the situation into, right? So, you know, it goes, surely that thing that he just took out from his waistband isn't a gun, that's normalcy bias. When it's obviously a gun, right? But your subconscious mind goes, too much, overload, can't handle it, go back to normal mode. Like, just pretend everything's normal, I'm sure it'll be fine. Right? And if your mind, if you allow your mind to do that, then you are setting yourself up for failure. So how does that, that, that's in an extreme situation. So coming back to our normal, just kind of considering alternatives, right? To various different situations is don't allow yourself to get stuck in normalcy bias. And one way that I've found that really helps with that is to ask questions that are difficult questions to answer. So when you're, when you're working through a scenario, remember we talked about all of our um, mental scenario uh, drills and all of that kind of stuff. And if you haven't heard that episode, go back and look up uh, how to run mental scenarios. So when you're running these, remember we mentioned things like ask yourself, okay, so I'm gonna do you know, X if they do Y, right? So if they do this, I'm gonna do that. And we talked about having realistic expectations about what's gonna happen in that situation based on your own capabilities, what you carry, what they might have, all of that sort of thing. And then once we work through that scenario, right? Maybe we work through it five or 10 times in our mind. And then we go, okay, so now I've got my response down. How could that go wrong? How could that fail, right? Now that, if you're doing it for real, that becomes very, very uncomfortable. Because, okay, let's say the scenario is you and your wife are out on a date and three dudes surround you, right? Like, let's say, I don't know how familiar anybody is with like Ybor City down in Florida, but it's over in Tampa. It's a nice little place. 
Um, they make cigars there, and it's kind of like a little subsection of Tampa. And there's a lot of stuff to do in the evening. There's some bars down there, there's some movie theaters, restaurants, stuff like that. And so, if it's just, you know, two adults, it's a nice place to go out on a date. And, but it's also a place where there's some sketchy sections, right? And you gotta kind of walk past some of the sketchy sections to get to the good sections. And it would be easy to find yourself in a situation depending on what time of day, specifically at night, that sort of thing, where all of a sudden you're surrounded by three drunk dudes who want to take your girl down the alley, right? And so you work through your scenario and you go, okay, okay, I think I got a, you know, I've got a reaction, I've got a, a plan that will take care of this problem. And then you say, okay, so how could that fail? And when you start really thinking, how could that fail? You have to really think, okay, oh crap, they just grabbed my girl and two of them are dragging her in the alley while the other dude's beating the crap out of me. Right now, if you're really thinking through that scenario, that is a really sucky situation to consider, right? But if you don't seriously consider it, you can't develop plans that will get you through it, okay? So you have to start really getting into uncomfortable areas in your mind to truly work through these things and be able to say, I've got a plan for pretty much whatever it is. Now, plans are just plans and they're not guarantees and you know a million things could go wrong, but if you're not thinking through these things, then you're, you're setting yourself up for failure, right? So coming back around to just looking at different options, what we often do in our mind is, as we learn about something, and this applies more into the really deep things like religion and morality and things like that, but it also gets into anything that you're passionate about. If you don't really care about it, you, you don't generally have this, this block, but if you're really passionate about something, then you kind of learn about it, right? Whether it's religion or whatever it is, but in this case, a lot of times it's is people in the dog world and a lot of people in the dog world are passionate and that's not bad but it just sets us up for failure in certain areas and we have to be aware of it and I think we should combat it and so one of the things that happens is we get really passionate about something we learn about it and we feel that all the stuff that we've learned is correct and especially if you're not out testing all that stuff all the time and by testing I mean on the field running actual scenarios as close to real life as you can or actually on the field training consistently and going, that thing I thought was true isn't working in this situation. Whatever the situation is, whatever the, the variable is. It could be a new dog, it could be a new um, obstacle, it could be a type of situation where we're doing bite work and the dog's just not responding properly, right? And, and we go, what is it about this situation that's causing either the dog to shut down, the handler to fail, the whatever it is, right? If you're not constantly testing those beliefs, then all you're doing is hoping, and hope is not a plan, as they say in the army, all you're doing is hoping that your information is correct, right? But even though that's the case, the vast majority of people operate this way. They learn a little bit, and I, I've seen this a ton in Christianity. They learn a little bit, they listen to their pastor or their priest or their friend or whoever, maybe they read the Bible a little bit and then they just hope that everything that they assume there is true based on what they're reading, seeing, hearing is actually true without actually challenging any of it. And you can't always do all the challenges yourself, which is why it's good to be around people who disagree with you and, and just have good discussions with them, right? Because maybe they're right, maybe you're right, but you should both walk away from it going, huh, I just got exposed to ideas that I haven't been exposed to before, and now I gotta go work through these ideas. And that's a good place to be, but it's an uncomfortable place to be for most people, right? So they get a little bit of information and then they refuse to challenge it, right? Now, I am not a leftist. In fact, I think most Republicans are extreme left-wing liberals. So that shows you where I am on the political scale if I would even place myself anywhere on the political scale because I think all the politicians are douchebags. But I am, 
you know, way, way on the constitutional uh, republic side, okay, in terms of politics. But I really enjoy having discussions with people who are on the left, whether that's Republicans or Democrats, because they're all on the left as far as I'm concerned. But when you start talking about extremists, what you, what you see a lot going on in our country right now is we've gotten to a point where nobody is willing to challenge their own ideas and they're not even willing to have the discussions and that's a dangerous place to be, right? So normalcy bias has led to the political situation we're in right now where you have all these people rioting because they don't even want to consider another alternative. Now, they might consider it and still disagree with it and that's okay, we can disagree. Our, our nation was built to have a group of people who disagreed about a lot of things, but it wasn't built to have a bunch of people who wouldn't even discuss their disagreements, right? So usually what happens in a disagreement, if you're going to discuss it and if you have to take practical action about something, is two people that disagree discuss the alternatives and the options and then they come up with a, a solution that's somewhere in the middle. They compromise, right? And there are places where compromise is a terrible thing, but most of the time, compromise is a really good thing, okay? Because most of the time, you're wrong about something, and they're wrong about something, and hopefully, if things go well, they push you in the direction of right in the areas where you're wrong, and you push them in the direction of right in the areas that they're wrong, right? So this normalcy bias gets so ingrained, so conditioned in us that we can't even consider something else because we're afraid that we might be wrong. Well, let me give you a little news flash here. You're wrong. Guaranteed 100% you're wrong about something. Probably about most things. Now, I don't mean you're 100% wrong, but you're not 100% right. And when we're talking right and wrong, if you're not 100% right, you're wrong. Which means in about 99.9% .9 of your life, you're wrong. And if you're upset about that statement, then you have a heavily ingrained level of normalcy bias. Now, I say that statement and I include myself in it. I'm wrong too. Right? And we should all be questioning our belief systems in every area. And I'm not, we're off of religion now. I mean, if you're a religious person, you should be questioning that too. But you should be questioning what you believe about physics if you're a physicist. And what you believe about engineering if you're an engineer. And what you believe about dog training if you're a dog trainer. And if you're a tactician, if you're a, an operator, you should be questioning all those things too. Right? And if you're training under anybody who says, you always do it this way, that person is definitely wrong because you never always do it some certain way. Okay, So now there are pros to being conditioned and we've talked about a lot of those pros through all of our training your subconscious different topics that we've discussed. Right, There are a lot of pros to conditioning ourselves to operate in a certain way. The downsides are we have to also challenge ourselves to the point where we are willing and we have zero fear in addressing some variation to our belief system, right? So you, and when I say zero fear, that doesn't mean that you're not gonna be uncomfortable with it. So when somebody starts to challenge me in a way that I've not heard before, right? Let's say, you know, I've studied in a specific argument in something a, a really long time and I've got a lot of evidence and proofs and all this sort of thing for some certain argument. And I start talking to somebody who is an expert in one of the fields that I've studied. Now, I've not done the studies, I've done the research, right? So whenever you do research, you have to trust that some other person is telling you the truth because we can't all go do all the studies. We have to trust in scholarship. And so I've read these scholars that say X, Y, and Z about blah, 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 and I go, okay, so if that's true, then blah, 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 it, it means this for my argument, right? And I've got my argument, I start talking to somebody, and they're an expert, or maybe they've really studied another expert who disagrees with the expert that I studied, and they start 
presenting things that I've not heard before and that counter some of the things that I have believed to develop my argument, right? I get a pit in my stomach when that happens. It's very uncomfortable. But I also have tried really hard to develop the idea where I go, huh, that's really interesting. Tell me more about what you're describing. Because I've also tried really hard to get over any fear of me being wrong, right? Because if I can't with confidence address any topic, then I really can't say I believe what I believe. If I truly believe what I believe, then I'm willing to allow it to be challenged, okay? So it takes a lot to get over this normalcy bias. There, there is an ingrained fear in I think almost everyone and the fear is I'm afraid to be wrong. We all need to believe that we're right about our most deeply held beliefs. Right? And, and this is something that we should be willing to challenge. As you challenge your own beliefs, you will be forced to change certain things, but a lot of times what you find is your underlying foundational beliefs are all solid. It's just you have to, to make an adjustment here and an adjustment there to accommodate for things that you'd never heard of before, that you've never been exposed to before. All right? So the pros are you can't process all the information all the time, so you need to have some level of conditioning to operate in high stress situations. The cons are you have to also combat that normalcy bias so that you don't ignore triggers and flags and things that are telling you something is really wrong here. We need to address this situation, right? And so you control your own conditioning by questioning yourself. You need to always be questioning, is this right? Is that right? How could this go wrong? What could happen here that would blow my plan out of the water? All of these things are very, very helpful to you. So I hope today has been useful. I hope that you've gotten something out of it. If you'd like to contact me and tell me uh, how much you agree, tell me a story about yourself that uh, either uh, supports or uh, blows this out of the water, or if you'd like to tell me how much I suck, you can email me at joel at fortresscanine.com. You can also sign up for my emails at my websites, fortresscanine.com or canineacademyonline.com. And please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can find us there by searching Fortress Canine or Canine Academy Online. And again, just a reminder, if you're interested in getting a working line puppy, contact us. We have Belgian Malinois, Dutch Shepherds, and German Shepherds available. Uh, until next time, remember to stay safe and train hard. Fortress Canine Podcast.